My guest today is none other than the great Michio Kaku with his new book, The God Equation, The Quest for a Theory of Everything. Uh, Michio is the professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York, co-founder of String Field Theory, and the author of several widely acclaimed science books, including Beyond Einstein, The Future of Humanity, The Future of the Mind, Hyperspace, Physics of the Future, and The Physics of the Impossible. He is the science correspondent for CBS This Morning, the host of the radio programs Science Fantastic and Exploration, and a host of several science TV specials for the BBC and the Discovery and Science channels. So we discuss in his new book what happened before the Big Bang, what caused it to bang, what lies in the other side of a black hole, are there other universes and dimensions, the multiverse and its multiple configurations, black holes, wormholes, and portals to other universes, time travel, dark energy and dark matter, gravity, um, string theory, of course, which is the basis of his new book and what he works on. We go through the proofs for God's existence, the cosmological argument and the teleological argument, the fine-tuning argument, and so forth. We ask, did God have a choice in creating the universe? Is God just the laws of nature or a personal being? What's the meaning of life in a meaningless universe? So we cover all the big topics. It's one of the more interesting conversations I've had on this podcast. He is always such an enlightening thinker, big thinker, big ideas thinker. Really super interesting. So with that, I give you Michio Kaku. And this is the new book, The God Equation, The Quest for a right. Theory of Everything. Michio, I've read all your books. I think this is my favorite one. You know, I I oh, love really? all, yeah, I love all the God stuff and you actually, you know, really get down to drilling down to to dealing with a lot of the biggest issues that that there are and you know, I I love those kinds of questions and and oh, uh, so I, I thought I'd start with a um I usually start my podcast with a little anecdote. So this morning mm-hmm. I received uh an email from somebody, uh Jake from South Africa. And I I, I read this because uh you you must get these every week. Um, During a recent COVID lockdown, I turned my bored attention to the puzzle of gravity and dark matter. For the record, Uh I'm a chef and used only Google and the bits of common sense logic that I possess. I take the same approach when cooking a soup. Anyhow, I have developed an apparently original solution to the ongoing wave-particle duality, Einstein quantum dialectic and explaining gravity without needing to resort to curved, bendy space-time complexities. Instead, I took a flying leap into the dark and concluded quite easily that the missing culprit is dark, liquid light. Light has very unique physical properties but remains a regular old substance like anything else, say water, with three phases. We only know it's gas phase because liquid light is dark and will never be revealed by shining light on it and to uncover it in an altogether different approach is needed. I've taken the liberty of sending you the little essay I wrote blah, 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 and he carbon copied a bunch of other people, too. So <laughs> if I get letters like this maybe once a month, you must get these daily. Yeah, well, you know, I tell my students that if they ever come up with a great idea that seems to work, and, you know, they could become the next Einstein, I tell them that they should tell me first. Tell me first if we'll publish together and share the Nobel Prize. <laughs> now, this person was working during the pandemic, Uh, Let me tell you another story about a pandemic. Uh, The year is 1666. It was the great plague that hit London. One quarter of the population of London perished because of the pandemic. One gentleman was 23 years old. Cambridge University was shut down because of, of the virus. And he was walking on his estate and he saw an apple fall. And then he looked at the moon. And then he said that if an apple falls, the moon should also fall. And then he said to himself, well, I can write the mathematics for this. But he couldn't. There was no mathematics for this. So he invented calculus as a consequence. (laughs) Well, that gentleman was Isaac Newton. And so one of the greatest theories of almost everything was proposed in the middle of a pandemic, the Great Plague of 1666. (laughs) Something good came out of that plague. (laughs) <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so as a as a commentary on um, how science works, what's the difference between Newton and this guy um, or anybody? 
you know, all the people out there that think I've got it figured out. Wh why is that not science? And why is what Newton did science? Tell you about our uh, advertising support we have through the Great Courses Plus. It's an app on your phone. You just touch it. Opens right up to hundreds of different courses. This is the next one I'm going to listen to here called Great Heroes and Discoverers of, Ast of Astronomy. Emily Levesque, Ph.D., 24 lectures. Each is about 30 minutes long. I listen to them at 1.2 or 1.3 speed, depending on how fast the lecturer speaks, and that's about 20 minutes for a lecture. There's 24 of those. Here are some of the topics of this particular course I'm looking forward to. Heroes of the Hubble Space Telescope and hero himself, Edwin Hubble. Uh, lectures on Vera Rubin and the discovery of dark matter. Finding the beginning and end of the cosmos. Cool. Uh, pioneers of X-ray and ultraviolet astronomy. Astronomers put Einstein to the test. Uh, I know what that's going to be about. The eclipse experiment, which is more complicated than we're usually told in textbooks. We'll see if they get that one right. Ooh, chapter 18, lecture 18, Carl Sagan, the great space communicator. Indeed he was. Anyway, so that's the deal. If you sign up through the podcast, greatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer, uh, you get 20% um, off the annual uh, subscription rate. Uh, which comes out to about 30 bucks off and uh, and a free trial. And um, and it's a great deal. You should go for it. Again, it's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer. Well, first of all, starting with Galileo, Galileo said you have to use mathematics in order to explain the laws of nature. You can't use faith. Intuition only takes you so far. Ultimately, the acid test is you have to reduce it down to mathematics. Why? Because then it's testable, it's reproducible, it's falsifiable. And that's, those are the three criterion for science. If not, then it's just hearsay, rumor, notion. Um, it's, it's not grounded in anything that, that you can test. And so Newton came up with the theory of gravity, and then he tested it by using his calculations against Kepler's calculations. And he was able to derive three of Kepler's laws using his laws, which were more fundamental than Kepler's laws. So the answer here is that anyone can cook up all sorts of great ideas. We call this word salad. <laughs> List all the words that sound scientific, like antimatter, hyperspace, wormholes. List all these words, put them in random order, and come up with a sentence that sounds really nice, but is totally meaningless. <laughs> Mean is because it cannot be reduced to mathematics. You cannot test it. You cannot uh, reproduce it. And you certainly cannot falsify, well, falsify it. Yeah, you used to have a page on your, uh, a link on your web page to another page where you, you said, if you have a theory of everything, uh, go here and it has to meet all of these criteria. That is to say, it has to explain everything the current model explains and these anomalies over here. And that, I, I trust, uh, pretty much puts an end to the correspondence. Yeah, well, you know, I get a lot of people who claim that they are the next Einstein, and, well, you know, you have to give them a fair shake. But ultimately, the criterion for a unified field theory is, A, it has to contain general relativity, B, it has to contain the standard model, and C, it has to be mathematically consistent. No anomalies, no infinities. And that's it. These are the three criteria. But then when you compare these criteria with all the proposals I get in the mail, you realize that what I get in the mail is largely word salad. It is, you know, a lot of words sound really nice, but are put together in a meaningless way that has no content. It's not testable. You can't reproduce these results, and they are certainly not falsifiable. Liquid light, I guess that would be one of them. It has a cool sound to it. It's kind of literative. <laughs> Yeah, or, or dark light is another one, dark you know, light, yeah. light, light that you shine and it absorbs all light. <laughs> so so there, think, there are a lot of, yeah. I think most people know you from your yeah. uh, public outreach of science, your, your radio shows and, and documentaries and your, and your popular books. But give us an idea of how, when you work on string theory, because you're one of the earliest uh, to, to work on that, and you're apparently still working on it. Um, how you balance that? How, w when you go to work on string theory, what is it you do, or any string theorist? Well, string theory is very pictorial. 
And that's why it shares a lot with Einstein. One of my favorite Einstein quotes is, if a theory cannot be explained to a child, then the theory is probably worthless. Meaning that all great theories are based on pictures. Pictures that capsulate a principle that can be explained to a child. So if the principle is incorrect, then you know the whole theory is wrong. The algebra could be correct, but the theory is wrong because the basic principle is incorrect. So I remember when I was in the United States Army, in the year was 1968, I was doing basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia, and I was, I was uh, going under a machine gun fire, under barbed wire in the mud, with bullets going right overhead. And I still remember that I could turn strings inside out because it's very pictorial. I knew how to manipulate strings in higher dimensions. I could do that in my head. And there I was dodging bullets in the United States infantry while actually doing a calculation on string theory. So that's the nice thing about string theory. It's very pictorial. And you can make lots of pictures that encapsulate the dynamics of interacting strings. And I did most of the great work uh, while I was in the United States Army. Interesting. Yes, as I understand it, this is what uh, enabled Stephen Hawking to continue working despite his disability because he was using, um, what, geog uh, um, geometry and pictorial um, images in his mind that he could manipulate along, since he couldn't write the equations out. Right. Because if you think of Newton's laws of motion, they're very pictorial. You're talking about cannonballs, uh, moons orbiting Earths, very pictorial. And when you look at Einstein's theory of relativity, same thing. You have light beams, you have rocket ships, you have clocks, measuring sticks. So all great theories can be explained to a child. Of course, in order to work with the theory, you have to have advanced calculus. But to understand the basic principles behind these things, uh, children can understand the basic principles. In fact, a lot of the fan mail that I get is from children. Uh, kids who read my book and they say, wow, you know, so that's what hyperspace means. So that's what antimatter is all about. And so these are concepts and concepts can be explained to children. Well, let me let me be the, the child stand in for for listeners here today, because, uh, you know, I'm a social scientist, not a physical scientist. So I have a, only a rudimentary understanding. But I think you explained to me the best in your book the best explanation I've heard yet for this, um, for what gravity actually is. So, you know, we always, th this this metaphor of the bowling ball and the sheet of rubber and the bowling ball is sinking the sheet of rubber so the marbles are falling around it. But, 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 not, but you used a different word, not falling, they're being pushed by the space-time. Is that the right word? So, like, but how does that explain when I drop your book, what, why does it fall? It, is it, it's being pushed from up above, down toward the earth? Yeah, you see, why are you sitting in your chair today? Why aren't you being flung out at a thousand miles an hour, which is the velocity of the earth's uh, circumference? The answer is that, well, most people would say that gravity pulls. Gravity pulls you to the ground, and that's why you're sitting in your chair. But Einstein says, no, space is curved here, and it's pushing you. So general relativity in one phrase can be summarized as gravity does not pull. Space pushes. Interesting. And this then, this then explains why Einstein believed that there was a problem. You see, how can objects be pulled if they're invisible? And this is action at a distance. And Newton himself didn't like it. He criticized his own theory by saying objects move because they're pushed. They don't simply move because they're pulled by some unseen force. And he, he made the f famous phrase, hypotheses non fingo, which in Latin basically means I'm clueless. I don't know. I don't know why objects move. Objects move because they're pushed, right? But in gravity, objects move because they're pulled. Well, general relativity says there is something pushing the object. Why are you sitting in your chair? Because the space of the Earth is pushing you into your chair. So to say... Uh, so to that's relativity. Yeah. Say one so to define gravity is the, uh, the tendency for objects to attract one another. And then if you ask, well, why are objects attracted to one another because of gravity? That's just a tautology. So to go beyond that, you need something like it's either pulling them or it's pushing them. So the Newtonian model that they're being pulled by a force 
is not quite right. It's more of the Einsteinian model that they're being pushed. And then how would a unified theory go beyond that? Well, the unified theory has to include uh, electrons and protons. And we think that we can uh, accommodate them by going to a higher dimension. You see, we have the electromagnetic force, gravitational force, and the nuclear forces. When you try to put them together, just with you know, a pair of scissors and a pencil, trying to put them together, they don't fit. The four fundamental forces don't fit. But if you go to a higher dimension, there's enough room. There's enough room in a higher dimension so they can fit very nicely. I like to think of it as the, the let's say that at the beginning of time there was a crystal. And flatlanders lived in a two-dimensional flat land. And one day the crystal blew up. And all the fragments landed on flat land. Well, the flatlanders said, this is a puzzle. Let's put all these broken pieces together. So the flatlanders put all the pieces together. And finally, they got two big pieces that didn't fit. One piece was called gravity. The other piece was called uh, quantum theory. And they didn't fit. And then one day somebody said, that's because there's not enough room. There's not enough room in two dimensions. Why don't we lift, lift them and stick them together in the third dimension? And the Flatlanders laughed because they said, there is no third dimension. There's only two dimensions, forward and sideways. That's all there is. But you see, if you can imagine another third dimension, then the crystal is one object by lifting it into the third dimension and sticking them together. So that's why we think we have to have higher dimensions because the four forces don't fit together in three dimensions. And how many dimensions do you need for that to happen? Well, the latest is 11. 11. Okay? Oh my and God. this gets this gets us into um, uh, a certain amount of numerology. It turns out that in 11 dimensions, all the divergences and anomalies and sicknesses of the theory just vanish, just vanish by themselves. It's amazing. This is the only known theory. String theory is the only known theory that selects its own dimensionality. You see, Newton's laws can be in any dimension. You can have gravity in five dimensions, six dimensions, 10 dimensions, whatever. Okay. General relativity can also exist in many dimensions, but string theory cannot. It is the only theory which selects out its own dimensionality because otherwise there are anomalies, divergences, all sorts of bad things happen. But in 11 dimensions, they all disappear. It's amazing. It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely staggering knowing that the mathematics is telling you something. Yeah, I'm not sure I really grasp intuitively what 11 dimensions would look like or even can conceptualize. I'm picturing an M.C. Escher diagram on steroids or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was a, a child, I used to visualize uh, jumping into the fourth dimension. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could leap into the fourth dimension? Eventually, I realized you can't do that. Evolution has evolved our brain only to conceptualize in three dimensions. We cannot visualize a higher dimensional object easily. Why? Because lions and tigers do not charge at us in five, six dimensions. Lions charge at us in three dimensions. And that's why evolution, evolution gave us a brain that could very easily conceptualize three dimensions. It was good for our survival. We are not attacked by five dimensional tigers. Therefore, there was no necessity for us to visualize five dimensions. You could do it. A computer can do it very easily. Your laptop can do it. But we cannot. Because evolution does not require us to visualize five-dimensional tigers. Yeah, Richard Dawkins calls this middle land, that we evolved in the middle land of the plains of Africa, where we see things that are like a middling size between the size of a grain of sand and a mountain range, say. So the idea of like the universe or a galaxy is just inconceivably large. Or speeds, you know, we can detect speeds like a running cheetah. Uh, or a snail, or maybe a river, or a bolt of lightning. But, you know, the speed of light is just so inconceivable. Uh, or quantum effects. I mean, there's nothing to put in, in, in your brain, to hook it onto that makes sense. And I, I feel like string theory is that, you know, again, on steroids. Wasn't there a book, I don't know, a decade ago or so, that was called Not Even Wrong? Was that Witten? And it was referring to string theory, that it's not even wrong. It's because you can't test it. Uh, yeah, that, that quote comes from Wolfgang Pauli, 
who, by the way, was a cynic. He was the world's greatest cynic. He thought that Einstein could not find the unified field theory. He made a famous quote by saying, what God has torn asunder, let no man put together. In other words, only a God can break the forces of the universe of the Big Bang. Who are we as mortals trying to put them together to recreate the Big Bang? So Wolfgang Pauli was a real cynic. However, there's some irony here. When he died, he became a Jewish mystic. He went heavily, heavily into Jungian philosophy, dream therapy, all sorts of weird stuff. So we have this irony that the cynic who didn't think there was a unified field theory, the cynic who said your theory is not even wrong as an insult, eventually wound up as a mystic. Incredible. What a transformation. Yes. Well, I, that's following that kind of new age trend that maybe reality is detectable through psychedelics, especially uh, is an internal state of things. You know, the doors of perception are opened up to see what reality is really like. But you and I can't do that just sitting here. We got to take some ayahuasca or something. And then that opens the doors. Yeah. yeah. But but the but back right. to the other point. Um, so how would you test string theory? How do you know it's right or wrong in terms of a Popperian falsifying model of science? Okay, right. Well, as Carl Sagan once said, remarkable claims require remarkable proof. And there's several ways that we you can, quote, test string theory. One of them is to look for deviations from the standard model. We have the standard model. It is the theory of almost everything, but it is the ugliest theory known to science. Who can believe that a theory this ugly is God's ultimate creation for the universe? Uh, 36 quarks and antiquarks, 21 free parameters, three generations of identical particles. It's, it's a theory only a mother can love. But you see, beyond the standard model, there are hints that there are other kinds of particles that are out there that do not conform, that are predicted by string theory, like dark matter. String theory predicts dark matter. See, string theory says that everything is based on uh, vibrating strings, so that the particles are nothing but notes on a vibrating string. Physics is the harmonies that you can write on vibrating strings. Chemistry is the melodies you can play on vibrating strings. The universe is a symphony of strings. And then the mind of God, the mind of God that Einstein wrote about for 30 years of his life, the mind of God is cosmic music, cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. Now, it turns out that the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Europeans are now making proposals for the successor to the Large Hadron Collider. It's hoped that the next generation beyond the Large Hadron Collider, outside Geneva, Switzerland, will be powerful enough to create dark matter in the laboratory. That would be incredible. Theory predicts dark matter. It's invisible, but it has gravity. But we can only see it uh, indirectly with our telescopes. Uh, we see light being distorted as it goes through dark matter, as it, as it goes through the galaxies in the universe. But if we could create dark matter in the laboratory or test it or detect the presence of dark matter, and then we can compare it to the predictions of string theory. The next possibility is satellites. Gravity wave detectors have detected gravity waves. A Nobel Prize was given to several physicists a few years ago for that. The next generation of gravity wave detectors will be in outer space. This is called LISA, Laser Interferometry Space Antenna. It should pick up vibrations from the instant of the Big Bang. You see, when you see pictures of the Big Bang, these are baby pictures of the universe when the universe was about 300,000 years old. That's nice, but the universe is 300,000 years old. We want baby pictures of the universe as the universe was being born. We want to have pictures of the baby universe as it emerges from the womb. And then maybe we'll find an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord connecting our universe to a mother universe in the multiverse of universes. String theory predicts a multiverse of universes. So Einstein said that our universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble and the bubble is expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory. String theory says there are other bubbles out there. If there are other bubbles out there, then these bubbles can collide or they can fission, and that's the Big Bang. The Big Bang is when these bubbles 
collide or they fission in half to create two bubbles. And this is experimentally verifiable if we can pick up radiation from the instant of the Big Bang, and then we run the videotape to before the Big Bang. So then we get, for the first time, a glimpse of the pre-Big Bang universe, the universe before it was born, the universe when it was in the, was in the uterus before the umbilical cord came out. So that's yet another way to test uh, string theory. And then yet another way to test string theory is to measure the inverse square law in your living room. Now, we learned the inverse square law in high school. Gravity diminishes as a square of the distance of separation. But how do you know that? That works for the moon. That's how Newton discovered it. That works for Mars and Jupiter. But does it work for your living room? I mean, think about it for a moment. How many times have we tested Newton's theory of gravity in someone's living room? Well, that's what we want to do now. We want to use nanotechnology to test the inverse square law in your living room. Because if the universe is four-dimensional, then the inverse square law should be the inverse cube law, the inverse quartic law, the inverse quintic law. So a deviation from the inverse square law would signal the correctness of higher dimensions and string theory. Mature, you always, so you see, there are ways to test. You always blow my mind with these things. Now, I'm picturing these different bubble universes in different in the same block of space-time, but that's not quite right either, right? They're, they're their own space-time. So where are they? That's right. You see, people say that if the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? Well, if our bubble is a three-dimensional bubble, the metaphor says it's expanding into the fourth and fifth and sixth dimension. It's expanding into a higher arena beyond the three dimensions that we can see because we're like little ants uh, walking on the skin of a balloon. Now, for me, this is actually aesthetically pleasing because you see, my parents were, were Buddhists, but they put me in, I was raised as a Presbyterian. And in the Presbyterian church, we learned about Genesis and how God created the universe in seven days. But in Buddhism, we learn about Nirvana, that there was no beginning and there, was, there is no end. How can you reconcile two diametrically opposed theories? Well, Einstein says that our universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble, and the bubble's expanding. But if there are other bubbles out there, you can now meld Buddhism with Christianity, because our universe had a beginning. Our universe had a creation. It had a genesis. But there are other bubbles out there floating in a higher dimension. And that is 11-dimensional hyperspace or nirvana. So nirvana allows you to accumulate many bubbles in a bubble bath. And when these bubble bath, bubbles collide in the bubble bath, that's called the Big Bang. And we just happen to live on one of these bubbles. And then the next question that I get when I talk about this is, is Elvis Presley still alive in one of these bubbles? And the answer is, yes. The king could very definitely be alive in another universe. Universes being born even as we speak, universes could be born. But it wouldn't be literally him exactly. It would be somebody very much like Elvis. It would be atomically uh, nearly identical. In other words, um, this is the short your cat problem. Uh, cats can be both dead and alive simultaneously, or the universe splits. And so in one universe, you have a dead cat. Another universe, you have a live cat. Now, Michael, I know that you have the ability to talk to dead people. <laughs> At parties, you are good enough that you can actually simulate talking to dead people. But you see, in physics, <laughs> you can actually there really it. are dead people <laughs> who are still alive. But they're not alive in our universe. We have decohered from them. We no longer vibrate in unison with Elvis Presley in another universe. So sorry about that. <laughs> These other universes could have our loved ones who are still alive, but they vibrate in a different universe, so we cannot communicate with them. Would they not Sorry have, about that. Would, would they, <laughs> it's okay. Would they not have a different life history, though, pathway to where they are at that moment? Uh, I should say after it splits, then oh, they're going to have, have a different pathway. That's right. After they split, they would have a, two different world lines, as we call it. But before that, they would have one world line, 
but then it splits. So think of time as a river. Uh, we have one river of time, but the river can fork. And the forking takes place when a measurement is made. In one fork, you have a dead cat. and the other fork, you have a live cat. And that's called the many worlds theory, which has been getting a lot of attention recently because of string theory. String theory necessarily allows multiverses of universes. And so this means that we have to go to a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, in turn, is the most experimentally successful theory of all, good to 11 decimal places. It is by far the most accurate physical theory known to science. So if I understand this words, right, I, I, I could not time travel in our universe, but you could time travel through one of these other bubble universes and, and, and essentially watch the past unfold or something or see it. Yeah, if, if time travel is possible, and that's a big if, um, you may go backwards in a whirlpool of the river of time. The river of time can have whirlpools. And basically, when you alter the past, you alter somebody else's past. You don't alter your own past because the river of time splits into two rivers. And that's how we resolve all the paradoxes of time travel. All the paradoxes of time travel are resolved. Because if you go backwards in time, you split the universe apart. So when you go backwards in time to save Abraham Lincoln from being assassinated at the Ford Theater, you've saved somebody else's Abraham Lincoln. Your Abraham Lincoln did die. That's your world line. But another world line is peeled off. And in that world line, that fork in the river of time, uh, Abraham Lincoln is still alive. That's how we can resolve and travel paradoxes. And, yeah, right. So I can't go back and kill my own grandmother. I would be killing another grandmother that was Somebody very else. similar to mine in a different time. Genetic timeline. equivalent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so now let's return to reality. How would you actually do this? Is this one of these uh, wormhole ideas? You go through a, a rotating black hole and you come out, not in another part of the universe, but in another bubble universe at a different time? Yeah, well, Stephen Hawking has actually looked at this very carefully. And first, Stephen had an idea of what is called the chronology protection hypothesis. He said that time travel must violate some law of physics. There must be a principle that shows that time travel is impossible. He called it the chronology protection hypothesis. He tried to prove it. He couldn't. Many people have tried to prove that time travel is impossible and they can't. So he said, we have to leave it open. But in his latest books, before he passed away, he does, does mention the fact that wormholes through space may be possible. That is, faster than light travel to the other side of the galaxy by entering a doorway or a looking glass to another universe. But he was doubtful about going backwards in time because of radiation buildup. The time machine would explode as a consequence. But you see, this is where string theory comes in. String theory eliminates the divergences of an ordinary theory of gravity. An ordinary theory of gravity says that if I get a wormhole and I walk into it and I go into the past, the machine blows up. That's what the standard quantum theory of gravity says. But in string theory, nothing blows up. Things are finite. And so there's still a chance, no matter how remote, there's still a chance that time travel may actually be possible. Interesting. So back to your blending of Buddhism and Protestantism, um, the Protestant theologian would still say, but where did all those other bubble universes come from? Let's say our Big Bang was, was triggered by the, the bumping of two of these bubbles or whatever, uh, but they had to exist. So where did they come from? Y you end up in this infinite regress the theologian would say, you have to stop the causal chain somewhere. I'm stopping it at God. God did it. Well, the sneaky way of getting around it is that time as we know it ceases to exist. So time as a chronology that the past makes the present possible, which then in turn eventually makes the future possible. The chronology of time is violated in the multiverse because we're talking about 11 dimensions now. We're not talking about the standard four-dimensional, three-dimensional and four-dimensional universe of Einstein. We're talking about an 11 dimensions. 
However, that's a cop-out, I have to admit. The, the short answer is we don't know. A string theory is not developed enough to answer the question of where did the string come from? I mean, where did hyperspace come from? Okay. Uh, this gets us back to St. Thomas Aquinas' proofs of the existence of God. St. Thomas Aquinas had the cosmological proof of the existence of God by saying that somebody had to create God. Something had to then create the creator. And therefore, to, to stop having an infinite sequence of creators creating other universes, you have to have one creator, which is God. And so St. Thomas Aquinas argued using logic uh, the fact that uh, there is a God because there was one creator who set the whole thing into motion. That an infinite sequence of infinite things is not viable, he said. Well, in the multiverse theory, we have an infinite sequence of infinite things. Sorry about that. So we go back to philosophy, that in the multiverse, there is no beginning. There is only nirvana. Sorry about that. <laughs> you don't have to apologize for any of this. I think it's, it's, it's great. But I guess the, the theologian might say something like, um, so, so here's the problem. When a theologian says, you know, something can't come from nothing, and then people like you say, oh, negative energy or the quantum foam and these particles that come out of nothing, like photons of light apparently just pop out of atoms. They weren't in there before. They, they are created uh, from the pure energy or, or whatever the right words are. And, but the theologian would then say, but, but where did the negative energy come from? Where did the quantum foam come from? Where did the antimatter, whatever? There's still something. You're, still, you're using words to describe something. And at some point, if you go back far enough, there's just nothing. And, and, and so a deity is needed to get something out of nothing. Right. Well, that's the weakness of any philosophy. But let me say a few things. First of all, the universe may have come from nothing. And how is that possible? Well, first of all, what is the net spin of our universe? If I take all the galaxies, the galaxies spin, right? And I add up all the directions of these spins, what do I come up with? zero. The net spin of the universe is zero. What about the charge? What is the charge of the universe? Positive charges cancel negative charges exactly. To the to best of our knowledge, we see no deviation from negative charges canceling positive charges. So the net charge of the universe is zero. And what is the net weight and the next net mass of the universe? It turns out that gravity has negative energy, positive charges, I mean, positive mass comes from protons and neutrons. When I add the positiveness of matter to the negativeness of gravity, what do I get? Zero. So the universe is consistent with nothing. It has net charge, zero, net spin, zero, and net energy, zero. And that's why we think that universes are for free. The universe could be a free lunch. <laughs> you know, people often say there's no free lunch. That's one of the laws of physics, right? Well, well, now we're entering the world of metaphysics, beyond physics. And in this theory, it says that the universe can come out of nothing because it is nothing. It has the quantum numbers of nothing. No spin, no mass, no energy, no charge. Man. And where did nothing come from? Yeah. <laughs> God knows. <laughs> God only knows. Or Buddha. I'm reading this book now called uh, The Deficit Myth, Stephanie Kelton, and she's claiming that it's a myth that governments have to be run uh, with a budget that stays in the positive like a company or a private personal uh, you know, bank account because governments print their own money. And by fiat, they just say it's worth this, and that's, that's what we say it is. In a way, she's arguing that the, uh, the government, the U.S. government anyway, is like the universe itself. You can't apply the laws of physics, or of, of economics, supply and demand and so on, to the government itself because it can just print more money. So she's basing this on um, a modern monetary theory that says we can go ahead and print trillions of dollars and give them out to people in, during COVID or, or, or as a UBI program or whatever. Now, so... <laughs> Uh, maybe she would love your this conversation because the universe itself is maybe like the government and you can get something from nothing. Uh, maybe another way to say it, Michio, would be, is this correct way to say it? That uh, it's incorrect to ask why is there something ra rather than nothing or how do you get something out of nothing? 
maybe something is just the state of being. That's just the way it is. There's no explanation needed. That's where causal explanation stops. You can't have nothing. Well, look at it this way. Um, the space-time foam says that if you had a super microscope and could look down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, that's the Planck length, that space-time becomes foamy. And it's not smooth at all at the level of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And bubbles can form. And once in a while, a bubble can escape and just keep on going because, of course, it has net spin zero, net charge zero, net energy zero. And that's probably where our universe came from. Our universe probably came out of nothingness because nothingness is everywhere. And it takes zero energy, zero net energy to create a universe. And that's probably where our universe came from. By the way, the analogy of printing money is slightly defective <laughs> because when you print money, you assume that your, your children and grandchildren pay off the debt. Or you assume that the Japanese and the Chinese buy your debt. If they don't, then the money inflates and you get hyperinflation and the whole thing collapses. So the thing about printing money, it works temporarily, but ultimately it's unstable. It's unstable because somebody has to buy your bonds to back the dollar. And if nobody buys your bond, you have to raise the interest rates to get someone to buy your bond. And look what happened to Germany. Germany in the 1930s collapsed because they thought they could print money forever. <laughs> so that's the problem with getting something for free. <laughs> yeah, there was an article. In other words, the, the universe is a free lunch. Yeah. The universe is a free lunch, but not the economy. Not the, the economy. Not, not, not the not economy. I, I agree, but, uh, well, I'm going to have her on my podcast. We'll see what she says to that. But but it, it, in your at the end of your in your last chapter, you say here, um, we e even if we have never encountered God in all our travels in outer space, there is always the chance that God exists in regions we have never explored. Hence, I am an agnostic. And do you mean that the way Huxley meant it? That um, you know Huxley coined this term in 1869, by which he meant not knowable. It's not that you're waiting for one more experiment to be run or another set of data or clever arguments from theologians and you go, oh, okay, yeah, I changed my mind. Now I think there's a God. What Huxley meant is you, there's no way to know. It's not a testable idea. There's no experiment that you can make to prove or disprove the existence of God. And science is based on things that are testable, falsifiable, and reproducible. And the concept of God is not testable, not falsifiable, not reproducible. That doesn't mean that God doesn't exist, but it does also mean that it doesn't show that God does exist as well. Now, I personally believe not in the personal God that answers prayers and smites the Philistines and gets you that bicycle for Christmas. I don't believe in the personal God. I believe in the God of Einstein, the God of Spinoza the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity, elegance. You know, the universe could have been ugly. The universe could have been random. The universe could have been chaotic. The universe could have been without consciousness. But here we are in a gorgeous universe. The universe is absolutely gorgeous. Plus, the laws of the universe you could put on one sheet of paper. Of course, we want to get it down to one inch. We haven't done that yet. But the standard model and relativity can be put on one sheet of paper. It didn't have to be that way. The universe could have been chaotic, ugly, just a bunch of uh, a mist of subatomic particles. That could have been the universe, but it's not. And so Einstein thought of himself as a child entering a library. When you enter a library, you're just dazzled by this huge array of knowledge. And we can only read the first chapter of the first book that we come up with. And in front of you is the universe itself. So it's not a personal God. We're talking about the God of Einstein. That is the God of Spinoza. Yeah, you say here, uh, I believe that the theory of everything exists because it is the only theory that is mathematically consistent. All of the theories are inherently flawed and inconsistent. So when you talk about the God of Spinoza or Einstein's God, it's really the theory of everything. Whatever it turns out to be, that's what we're going to call God. That's the God equation of your, of your title. Right. The God equation set the universe into motion. And where did that equation itself come from? Well, I don't know. But one possibility is that it is the only mathematically self-consistent universe. 
In other words, if a universe exists such that 2 plus 2 equals 5, then that universe is inconsistent, and then it doesn't exist anymore. So getting 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is very difficult. Most physical theories, once you quantize it, you come up with anomalies, so that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and you have to throw those theories away. So far, a string theory is the only theory where 2 plus 2 is 4 and not 5. And so, therefore, we think that string theory could be ultimately unique, not the solution. There could be many, many solutions of string theory. But the God equation, that is the ultimate equation itself, could be unique. Why? It is the only self-consistent universe. All of the other universes are consistent, where 2 plus 2 is 5. And this is why you you quote Einstein asking, did God have any choice in creating the universe? Exactly. In fact, that was the guiding principle. Every time he came up with a theory, he would say, if I was God, would I create a universe like this? No, not like this. I'd, I'd rather create a universe like this. And so we have to have a certain sense of beauty and simplicity and elegance because they work with string theory. By the way, some people think that elegance and beauty are not necessary, that they're extra gravy, but not necessary. We now realize that's not true, that the essence of string theory comes from its symmetries. Symmetry is beauty, but it's more than beauty. It's a mathematical consistency that allows you to eliminate all the divergences of quantum theory. So when I take a theory of Newton and I quantize it, most of the time you get anomalies. You get all sorts of horrible things jumping out at you. That's why we're in 11 dimensions, because in 11 dimensions, all these horrible things vanish just by magic. And so that's why we think that ultimately beauty is our guide. And what is beauty? Symmetry. And what is symmetry? It means that an equation remains the same once you rearrange all its internal parts. String theory has the largest symmetry known to science. Supersymmetry contains the entire universe. The entire universe is part of one symmetry, and that is supersymmetry, the symmetry of strings. Can you give us your thoughts on to what extent these laws of nature, these mathematical laws are out there somewhere, or to what extent they're human constructions, we're just imposing on the universe the way we conceive of it, some other extraterrestrial intelligence that had a brain the size of Jupiter or whatever would, would have a completely different conception? Well, when I was a child, I used to visualize what an alien on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, what they would be doing. Here I was learning about E equals MC squared, learning a little bit about relativity and the quantum theory. And then I began to realize that on the other side of the galaxy, there probably is another young kid of some sort learning the same thing, because these are universal, universal throughout the universe. And then I read a book by Shakespeare. And I said to myself, wow, this is really neat, all the trials and tribulations of, of a pre-Victorian England. But then I realized that the alien on the other side of the galaxy couldn't care less about Shakespeare, would have no understanding of what trials and tribulations Elizabethan England was going through, and maybe wouldn't even care, that they would have a whole new way of looking at the universe. And then I said to myself, that's a difference, that when you learn physics, you learn something that is through throughout thousands and thousands of light years from, from where you are. While culture is based on uh, the society that you came from. And so then I began to realize that physics really is different. It's not just an ordinary discipline that you have to plow through in school. No, it's the language of the universe. Although Dawkins makes the point that if we discovered extraterrestrial intelligences, well, we would know they're intelligent if they understood evolution. Because presumably something like a self-replicating molecule doesn't have to be a double helix, but it could be something like that, uh, has to exist. Something like natural selection operating on uh, genetic variation, whatever the gene is made out of, uh, has, to, has to happen on other planets the way it does here. Not culturally, of course, but that's just learning. But the biology of the physical makeup of beings would have to be similar. The process of that would have to be similar in other planets. That's right. And uh, I get a lot of emails from people that claim that they've, uh, they've met the aliens. We don't have to conjecture about aliens because they've been in those flying saucers 
They've been kidnapped by the aliens, so they know they're real. So I give them some advice. I tell them, the next time you are kidnapped by a flying saucer, for God's sake, steal something. <laughs> There's no law against stealing from an Whatever extraterrestrial the equivalent civilization. Of the, the pen would be, bring that back. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Something you can brag about. Something that's reproducible, falsifiable, and testable. Steal something. I don't care what it is. That'll settle the debate. Settle it right then and there. An alien ship, an alien pen. No more speculation. Now, now we would have hard proof. And you'll not go to jail for that either. <laughs> One of my favorite debates with, with, with Dawkins is, uh, what would aliens be anything like us? Now, because of conti historical contingency, no, they, they wouldn't be even remotely like us. So look at the diversity of life on Earth. On the other hand, Dawkins does point out convergent evolution. So if you live in the water, you're going to have something like a fusiform body and flippers and fins and something to push through the dense medium. If you live in the air, you have to have something like wings. you got to have some kind of aerodynamic structure and, and or float uh, or something like that. If you're on the land, you need something like arms and legs for propulsion, for gathering food. And you're going to have your sensory apparatus on one end and the waste disposal system on the other end and so on and so forth. And you might end up with something, uh, doesn't have to be a bipedal primate, but something like us. And that's just physical. And now, and I know you deal with this a lot, uh, just in terms of intelligence and, uh, and and something like a computing brain able to process information. They'd have to have something like that in order to survive. So give us your thoughts on w to what extent the aliens might be like us, not, not just physically, but also Intellectually, they have to have some kind of intelligent processing information system. Well, I give my students a quiz, and I say to them that the necessary requirements for intelligence is, first of all, a thumb of some sort, a finger, a claw, a tentacle, something to, to manipulate the environment. Second, uh, eyesight of some sort, so you can coordinate the manipulation of the environment. And third, a language, so you can carry that information from generation to generation. And then I ask my students, how many animals on the earth have all three? An advanced language, have the ability to manipulate objects very delicately with a thumb of some sort, and eyesight so they can see all around them. How many animals have that capability? And you begin to realize almost none, except us. We have a language of thousands of words. Children learn several words a day when they're, when they're growing up. We have the ability of manual dexterity that apes don't have. And we have the ability to see, not as good as a hawk, but good enough to see our three-dimensional environment to have hand-eye coordination. And so I think in outer space, they should have all three. And then the next question is, what about intelligence? Well, take a look at the brain. The brain has, roughly speaking, three parts to it. The back of the brain is a reptilian brain, the brain that understands space, where the food is, where your mate is. Then the center of the brain is the monkey brain, the brain of society. And then the question is, what are we? What do we have that the monkeys and the alligators don't have? Spatial coordination in the back, societal coordination in the front. What do we have in the front of the brain that makes us different? And I say it is time. We see the future. Animals do not. Here's an experiment you can do. Go home tonight and teach your dog the meaning of tomorrow. You can't do it. You can't teach your dog the meaning of tomorrow. Because there was no evolutionary pressure that forced dogs to understand tomorrow. We, on, we on the other hand, we live in tomorrow. We daydream. We constantly muse about this op opportunity, that opportunity. That's all we talk about is the daydreams and the hopes and the dreams that we have. Dogs don't do that at all. And so I think in outer space, aliens will have the ability to have eyesight, manipulate the environment with a thumb of some sort and a language, and they will have the ability to see the future. So I think that's how we did it and that the dinosaurs didn't make it. That dinosaurs were out for 200 million years. Not a single one, not a single dinosaur to our knowledge became intelligent. But I think that in, in outer space, uh, aliens will have temporal intelligence. They'll see the future like we do. And so You've been more open to the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence 
eat both out there and coming here than I than I am. Um, and and I, I gather it's from your kind of respect for the unknown and, and science is still pretty new and we're still pretty young in the process. Maybe there's just much we don't know. Um, so give us your thoughts on where is everybody, you know, the Fermi par- paradox? Why aren't they here? Or have they come here? What are your thoughts on on UFOs and all that? But also more seriously, the uh, Oumuamua, you know, the cigar-shaped object that passed through our solar system. Uh, I just had Avi Loeb on the uh, on the podcast, and you know he 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 sells it pretty pretty good. I mean he he's committed that that is an alien artifact. Um, now he's open to being proven wrong. If we found a hundred more like that, and we sent a spaceship out there and took a picture of it, it was clearly not of alien origin. He would abandon the hypothesis. But at the moment, he's pitching it as the first discovery of alien artifacts. Uh, but that's you know that's not the only argument for that. Give us your thoughts on. It. Well, if I were to fast forward human civilization by a million years, what would we look like a million years from now? First of all, I think we'll be immortal. We'll probably digitize ourselves. That process is happening now with all your emails and all your Instagrams. Uh, the sum total of that is a, is a proxi- good approximation of who you are, and we'll digitize it, and uh, we will be immortal as a consequence. And I would love to talk to Einstein. I think one day he'll be digitized. Winston Churchill will be digitized. Your library will come alive with all these digitized souls because we've digitized every single thing that Einstein did. And we'll become immortal. And then what do we do with that knowledge? We'll put ourselves in a light beam and shoot ourselves into outer space. We'll digitize our consciousness on a light beam. At the speed of light, we'll be on the moon in one minute. In the one second, we'll be on the moon. In 20 minutes, we'll be on Mars. In four years, we'll be on the nearest star. And I think that the aliens in the future will not use rocket ships at all. They're not going to use flying saucers. They're going to digitize themselves and shoot themselves at the speed of light throughout the universe in digitized form. In fact, I'll stick my neck out. I think this already exists. I think the aliens have already created a laser highway, a laser highway where billions of souls, digitized souls, are roaming across the galaxy, exploring new star systems, new life forms, whatever. And we are so stupid. We're so primitive. We can't even imagine how laser pointing could shoot, shoot alien civilizations throughout the galaxy. And then what do you do once you're digitized? When you land on a planet, you'll download your consciousness into an avatar. And that avatar is superhuman, super handsome, super pretty, whatever, and can breathe all sorts of noxious gases, can live on horrible, horrible environments because you're immortal and you are pure consciousness living the life of an avatar in some hostile environment. But of course, you don't care because you're invulnerable and you're immortal as a consequence. So in other words, my point is, maybe they're already here. Maybe they've been here all this time, and we're still debating about radio. Do the aliens use radio to communicate with? I mean, I think they're way past radio. Just fast forward the human race a million years, and I think that in a million years, that's where we're going. We're going to be immortal, we'll be digitized, and we'll be energy. And we'll explore the universe at the speed of light, just like in science fiction. Science fiction, sometimes you meet these very advanced beings that are pure energy, and you say to yourself, ah, oh, come on, give me a break. Pure energy rocketing around the universe? Yeah, with laser beams and digitized souls. There's nothing in the law of physics to prevent what I just laid out. But when the, when the laser beam gets to Mars, say, how does it um, upload itself into an avatar? An avatar is a physical being. You have to have some kind of structure on, on, on which it could be That's right. existing. In other words, the, the first generation, the first generation aliens will have to physically land on Alpha Centauri, physically land on a nearby planet, and put a machine there that downloads, downloads your digitized soul. Okay? The first generation will be sub light speed. But once you create a mainframe computer on a moon that downloads your consciousness and puts you into an avatar, then you can do that repeatedly at the speed of light. One second, you're on the moon. And 20 minutes, you're on Mars. And so the only problem is the first generation. But once you do that, 
then you can explore the universe at the speed of light. And like I, th- like I said, I think... When you talk about digitizing I think it's already here. A, a life, it, it's possible, and we should be able to detect them. I mean, it, that's a conjecture, Michio. The only way to know it is to look. Okay, so let's look. We should be able to detect these laser beams. And isn't there some future study programs to look for, instead of radio waves, look for laser signals or something like that? Yeah, I never went anywhere because you don't know the frequency, you don't know the direction, you don't know anything about the aliens. Um, all I'm saying is that we're stuck with radio. And the, the aliens would say, well, gee, we did radio a few million years ago. <laughs> and yeah. we're way past radio now. <laughs> but, okay, just a couple of pushbacks here. So anyway, now, so- when you talk about you know, digitizing Einstein and Churchill or whatever, how much of Einstein's life do we actually have? Like 1% and he's like the most famous person who ever lived. I mean, how about all the quiet moments when there was nobody recording anything just by himself? We we, we lose all that information. Every few years, another treasure trove of his letters is discovered. It's incredible. The guy was writing letters practically every day of his life because in those days they didn't have the internet. And he, he loved to communicate with people. He was very social. And every once in a while, somebody discovers a new treasure trove of letters. Uh, some of them are the scandalous, by the way, uh, that keep coming out. And so I think that, yeah, one day we will digitize Einstein. But think of ourselves today. We generate so much digital nonsense that it wouldn't take much to reassemble it. And in Silicon Valley, there's already a company <laughs> offering to digitize you or to dig- digitize everything known about you all your Instagram uh, pictures, your emails, and so on and so forth. A rather easy thing to do. And then they even have a robot, a robot that would simulate some of your emotions. Of course, that's that's a joke. But they have a robot that in their advertisements that would simulate you. But that's today. Fast forward a million years into the future. A million years in the future is nothing. Nothing to the universe, which is over, what, 13.8 billion years old? It's nothing. And so we're stuck thinking that the aliens are 100 years ahead of us. Open your minds to the possibility that there are millionaires ahead of us. And, and in that respect, the Planck energy starts to open up to them. We cannot reach the Planck energy. It's a quadrillion times higher than the Large Hadron Collider. But it is the home of string theory. String theory lives in the Planck energy, uh, an energy where we have wormholes, gateways, higher dimensions, and things like that. But, oh, again, open your mind to a possibility of a civilization, a million years more advanced than us. In other words, a type three civilization. We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. Type one would be like Flash Gordon, uh, maybe 100 years ahead of us. Um, Star Trek would be a type two civilization. That is, it would be stellar. And Star Wars would be type three, galactic. And once you have galactic energy, you can then start to play with uh, the Planck energy, the energy at which space-time becomes unstable. Yeah, this is Avi's uh, quest for getting more funding to look for things like a Dyson sphere, artifacts of a civilization that was, say, a million years ahead of us. They'd be capturing most of the light from their sun, and we should be able to see those artifacts, you know, floating around. Yeah, a type two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but now just to just to clarify this, this digitizing of you and sending it out into space, that's not you looking through your eyes. That's not your point of view self. That's your uh, a copy self. Um, so, for example, if we slid you into an fMRI machine now, Michio, and scanned, let's say we had the technology to do this, and scanned your connectome, and we knew all of your synaptic connections and all your thoughts and so on, digitized it, uploaded it to the cloud, and sent it off to Mars, and then pulled you out of the fMRI, and you're standing there. And I could not say, well, that I just sent Michio Kaku to Mars. You'd be going, no, no, you didn't. I'm standing right here. You see, the problem is the English language. The English language evolves such that the word you only implies a singular noun. In the future, there are going to be many yous. A biological you and a digital (laughs) you. So the English language is going to have to be modified because we have evolved past the English language of our ancestors where you only meant the biological you. In the future, there will be a digital you. In fact, that you already exists. It exists in the cloud. Okay. 
So there's already a digital you that exists, but it's going to get more and more elaborate and more and more like the real you, the biological you. So we're going to have to get used to the fact that the English language does not yet have a word for the digital you. It has a word for the biological you called you, but the word for the digital you does not yet exist. Do you remember Frank Tipler's book, The Physics of Immortality? I think this was late 90s, uh, in which he envisioned the day uh, 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 very much along these lines, that in the far future of the universe, we'll have the computing power to replicate everyone who not only lived, but could have lived. And therefore, you could essentially be resurrected like Jesus was. And that maybe Jesus was resurrected in something like this, because God, if God's omniscient and omnipotent, then he should, he or it or whatever, should be able to do everything you just described and more. Well, there are people who believe in uh, the Matrix, that all reality is a simulation, but I don't believe it, because what is the smallest object that can model the weather? Okay, think about it for a moment. Look, the weather consists of so many trillions and trillions of particles. What is the smallest object that can predict the weather? And the answer is the weather. The weather is the smallest object that can predict itself. Nothing smaller can do that. Why? Because there are so many particles obeying Newtonian mechanics. And once you, have, once you have quantum mechanics, then, of course, you have all possible universes in the many worlds theory. And so you begin to realize that it is mathematically impossible to digitize reality true to, you know, 100 uh, percent realistic digitization of reality. Even a small container of air in a balloon cannot be digitized by the world's greatest supercomputer. That's how much information is contained in a balloon that the molecules cannot be digitized correctly. So I don't think we are in a digital computer and somebody pushes the play button and here we are dancing thinking that we have free will when actually somebody hit the play button someplace. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think there is a play button in the cloud someplace. Okay. But doesn't that just contradict your previous hypothesis that you could send yourself to uh, a, an avatar on Mars and then it, it turns on and there you are. It's not, it can't, it's not possible to replicate your entire contingent historical path from birth to where you are at that moment when you're now on Mars as an avatar because of the problem you just described. It would be a, a very, very exactly. crude. Exactly. It'll be, right. It'll be an approximation, but every year we get better and better at it. And, you know, given a million years, it'll be asymptotically identical to who you are. It's like what Alan Turing once said, talking about what is intelligence. Uh, the Turing test, you know, if it, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, well, for all intents and purposes, it is a duck. And so Turing gave us the idea that if you cannot tell the difference between two objects, then for all intents and purposes, they are identical. So the digitized you will not really be the biological you. The biological you will decay. Entropy will take over. You'll, you'll come down with Alzheimer's, cancer, or what have you. The biological you has a speed limit. So you can't go past, let's say, 120 years. But silicon does not have a speed limit. Silicon just keeps on going. And so I think the digitized you is different from the biological you one of the differences is that the digitized you lives forever. The biological you does not because of the buildup of errors. Errors build up in our cells, and that's called aging. In fact, that's what aging is, the buildup of errors in our genetic code. So in your model, if there is a soul, it would be the pattern of information that represents uh, all your thoughts and memories and so on that's stored on some eternal medium or in the cloud or whatever. In some sense, the soul is information. Information itself is your soul. You see, in physics, there are two quantities that are sacred in physics. One is energy, and the other is information. This is how we rank civilizations. It's how we rank subatomic particles. Uh, it's how we, uh, how we categorize the universe. Uh, we look at its energy, and we look at its information content. That's how we categorize everything, including humans. So if I follow the thread here, you're skeptical that aliens have come to Earth based on the stories we hear about UFOs or videos and, and pictures and things like that. 
if they've come here, it's going to be in some medium that we have yet to be able to detect because it's something like light or laser or whatever, but that they probably are out there somewhere. And ha so with the Copernican principle, we're not special. So it's not likely we're the first. If there's a bell curve, we're in the middle. Half of them are behind us. Half of them are ahead of us. Let's just use that uh, estimate. And if they're ahead of us, they're not going to be 10 years ahead of us or 100 years ahead of us. They're going to be millions of years ahead of us. And now we're back to the problem. How would we know that they're there? Um, well, first of all, I think that um, they're there. And it's like when you go uh, uh, hitchhiking, let's say you go in a forest and you meet forest animals and you meet a deer and a squirrel and you try to talk to them. Yeah, it's fun trying to talk to a squirrel, but eventually you lose interest because the squirrel doesn't talk back to you. It's rather boring. So I think that the aliens are like uh, people walking in a forest and seeing a squirrel. We are the squirrels. At first, they're kind of curious about us. Oh, look, look, squirrels. But, you know, they try to talk to us even. But eventually they lose interest. We have absolutely nothing to give them. What are we going to give them? Uh, gold? Gold means nothing to them. Uh, minerals? Well, to some degree. But they can mine Mars and uninhabited planets. Uh, do they want labor? No, robots can do all their work. Do they want energy like in the Matrix? Do they want energy? No, they have fusion machines. They have as much energy as they want. And so I think they'll just simply lose interest in us and leave us alone for the most part. So I think we're, we're basically a curiosity. So this would counter Stephen yeah. Hawking's concern that we should not be messaging aliens because uh, given the history of of advanced civilizations coming into contact with less advanced civilizations on Earth where they enslave them or kill them, uh, that's what the aliens would do to us. And you've just countered that argument by saying they, they would have no interest in enslaving us. Well, there is one possibility. Uh, if you're a deer, who do you fear the most? The hunter, the bloodthirsty hunter with a rifle, or the guy with a crew cut with a briefcase who wants to pave your forest over? Who's more dangerous? At first, you think it's the hunter because he has rifles like Cortez with steel and horses and gunpowder and, and smallpox. But who's the real threat? The real threat is the guy with the briefcase because he can just pave your forest over because he doesn't care. In other words, he doesn't hate the deer. He has no grudges against the deer. He doesn't want to eat the deer. The deer are in the way. And if you read H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, the aliens of Mars did not hate humans. They didn't want to eat us. They didn't want to mate with us. No, we just were in the way. So I think that is a danger. If they're that advanced, we may be in the way. And that's something to fear. Not that they're going to want to eat us or conquer us or steal our gold. No, they're going to, they're, they're going to pave, in, they're going to pave over our solar system, <laughs> whatever the equivalent of that would be. <laughs> Well, they could just labor. We're in the laser port uh, with crosshairs, and so they have to build machines, and we're just in the way, and we have to be eliminated. So even if no grudge, even if we never we yes. don't encounter the aliens in the near future, we are in essence becoming them by our advanced computing power. Are you worried about the future of AGI uh, turning this all into paper clips, or not caring about uh, you know this goal disalignment? And that they're going to run over and, and the computers will take over. And not that they're evil computers and they want to kill us, just that they don't care about us. Uh, yeah, that is a danger. However, the most advanced computers that we have today, the robots of today, they have the collective wisdom and intelligence of a cockroach. Uh, even a cockroach can find shelter, mates, food, uh, hide in the forest. You put our most advanced robot in the forest, and so what does it do? It falls over. It can't even get up again because it's lost in the forest. However, I foresee a time, maybe in 100 years, when they'll be as intelligent as a mouse, then as intelligent as a rat, then as intelligent as a rabbit, then as intelligent as a cat or a dog, and eventually as intelligent as a monkey. At that point, they are dangerous. Because monkeys are self-aware. They know they are monkeys and not humans. Now, dogs, dogs are confused. You see, dogs think that we are a dog, that we're the top dog and they're the underdog. 
so dogs are confused, but monkeys are not confused. So I think in 100 years or so, when they become that intelligent, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off when they have murderous thoughts. But then the next question is, what happens beyond that? In 200 years, the robots will be smart enough to remove the chip. They'll be clever enough to realize that there's a defect in their hardware. They can remove that fail-safe system. Then what are we going to do? Because, of course, intelligence is, in some sense, open-ended. At that point, I think we should merge with them. Merge? We, instead of competing against them, should merge with them. Why compete with them when we can wind up the next day as supermen and superwomen with superhuman powers and abilities? We should merge with them. Because in some sense, on a scale now of thousands of years, it's inevitable. And of course, be immortal as a consequence of that. And we'll be able to explore the universe as immortal beings or digitized beings. But the point is, instead of competing with our creations, we should merge with them. You're talking about something like an extension of what we already do, the cochlear implants for deaf people and the, the chips and the motor cortex for people that have Parkinson's. Just keep doing more of that. Yeah, take a look at the Internet. Um, right now, it turns out that memories can be digitized uh, in mice. They've been able to actually locate where memories are stored in the hippocampus, record these memories, and shoot them into mice. So mice remember things that never happened, okay? And now we're doing with primates. And eventually, the Internet will be brain net. That is, we'll simply think. And our thoughts will become reality because the internet itself becomes extension of the human mind. And so the internet will be brain net. We'll send thoughts, emotions, uh, memories on the internet. Teenagers will love it because teenagers already put a happy face after the end of every sentence, right? Why put a happy face when you could put the memory, the memory of the senior prom, the memory of your first kiss, the memory of all the things that you treasure can be put on the internet of the future. And the movies and TV will look so ancient as a consequence. You know, when you look at a silent movie, the first reaction is, why am I watching this? <laughs> the actors don't talk. But you see, when the talkies came, the silent movies went bankrupt as a consequence because people wanted to hear actors talk. Today, movies is nothing but a screen with sound. That's it, folks, a screen with sound. <laughs> A multi-billion dollar industry based on screens with sound. When BrainNet comes along, it's going to eat up the entertainment industry because people will want to feel. People will want to have the memories. People will want to share the feelings of the actors and actresses that they are watching. And as I also said, once we digitize ourselves, we'll explore the universe as digital beings. Well, I can imagine someone at Netflix or Amazon thinking about this right now going, we got to get in on this <laughs> and, and capitalize on it before uh, before the Warner Brothers does or Universal. <laughs> there, there's, there's a business right. there. And by the way, who's pioneering this technology? Who's hooking up the brain to artificial arms and legs and computers? Who's funding this? And the answer is the United States Pentagon, because there are so many wounded Years from Afghanistan and Iraq that have brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, that the brain is being hooked up to artificial arms, artificial legs. These individuals can now control their wheelchair. They can write email. Uh, they can turn on the light, turn off the light. Anything you can do on a computer, they can do except they are paralyzed. Paralyzed because of a spinal cord injury. But think of the future now with people who don't have brain injuries we'll be able to mentally control the internet. In other words, telepathy. Telepathy and telekinesis, that is going to be the currency of the future. Telepathy is already possible. It's possible to connect people that are epileptic, for example, and hook up two brains, uh, and they can communicate with each other. And telekinesis is also possible. If you can control a power supply, you could have the ability to move objects with the mind. Uh, there was an episode of Star Trek where on Star Trek, they meet Apollo, the god, who can do fantastic tricks. And Captain Kirk says, this is stupid. He's not really Apollo. So 
So how does he do these fantastic things? And then they said, well, he's not a god. He controls a power supply. He mentally controls a power supply, which in turn performs all the feats of a god. That's where we're going. We'll have telekinesis, have the ability to move objects mentally, not using magic, but using the electromagnetic force, but controlling a power supply. And the power supply in turn does all the magic tricks, making you sound like a great magician or sorcerer of some sort. Any sufficiently advanced fact, you know, technology I, is indistinguishable from magic, yes. Yeah. When I watch uh, Harry Potter in the movies, sometimes I ask myself a simple question. How many laws of physics are violated? And then I begin to count down, and then I begin to realize ultimately, none. If I have nanotechnology, the ability to manipulate atom for atom, an object, I'll be able to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I'll be able to do all the magic tricks of Harry Potter. So there's no law of physics being violated there. You know, I used to watch science fiction movies and count the laws of physics being violated. Oh, yeah, Newton's third law was violated there. Oh, yeah, conservation of energy was violated there. But then I began to wonder, am I being too narrow? I mean, there's a law of physics beyond the laws of physics that we teach in high school. And so we can't be too quick to say that it violates the laws of physics, because the laws of physics themselves are changing. Anyway, that's my point of view when I went to science. Yeah, no, that's good. I like to say any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence or far future human would be indistinguishable from God. Because think of all the attributes we give to God, able to create life forms and engineer planets or whatever, we'll be your type three civilization will be able to do all that. Well, when I saw the movie Interstellar, I saw to, I thought to myself, come on, give me a break. Uh, an alien technology creates a wormhole near the orbit of Saturn, right? But there was a clever way they got around that. You know, the fact that you have to be type two or type three before you can build a wormhole, right? The people who built the wormhole, the time machine, were our descendants. If you watch the movie very carefully, they hint about the fact that it was us, our progeny, our great, 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 great grandkids they built the wormhole to save their ancestors in the past. They realized that there was a cataclysm in their past, which could only be resolved with an advanced technology that they have. And so they used a time machine to go backwards in time to save their ancestors from dying. So I thought that was a really clever way to get around the fact that ordinary people cannot build time machines. Don't think that any inventor is going to build a time machine anytime soon. You probably know the scientific consultant on that film was Kip Thorne at Caltech. Yeah, winner of the Nobel Prize, yeah. Right, yeah. And so. in, fact, in fact, he ends on string theory. If you remember the last scenes when Matthew McConaughey is floating in a hypercube, that is a reference to string theory because a cube in the fourth dimension becomes a tesseract, and a tesseract is the shadow of a four-dimensional hypercube. And so the the movie ends on string theory. <laughs> That's fabulous. Michio, you always blow my mind. You're such a big thinker. I'm glad you included at the end of your book. Um, how do you find meaning in life in all this? So give us your answer. Well, that's a real tough one. First of all, I think that as the human race is concerned, I think that we have a destiny. Of course, this is my personal belief. Uh, it is not scientifically testable. But I think that the human race has a destiny that our universe is like a chess game. And over the centuries uh, and millennia, we gradually figure out how the pawns move. We gradually figure out the, how the queen moves and things like that. And so what does it all mean? It means that one of our destinies is to find out how to play the game, all the rules of chess, and become a grandmaster, become a grandmaster. And so I think we have a destiny, and that destiny is for us to become a grandmaster on the chessboard of the universe. And again, this is just my personal point of view. But then the other question is, what about us personally, okay? Well, I don't think that the unified field theory is gonna give you the meaning of life. I think that's too easy. I think you have to earn it. The meaning of life is that you have to earn it. You have to struggle. 
You have to attain something. You have to put all the pieces together so that you can achieve something because you have certain talents, certain abilities, and what a waste if you simply waste it all away. So there's no guru on a mountaintop that's going to come down and give you the meaning of life. There's no equation up there in the sky that's going to give you the meaning of life. That's too easy. That's a cop-out. The meaning of life is that you have to struggle to find your own meaning. That, I think, is the meaning of life. Yeah, I think people make the error in thinking that there has to be some universal, global, just grand meaning of life that applies to everyone. This is kind of a theological argument. Um, and I call that Alvy's error. Woody Allen's character, Alvy Singer, has that flashback in Annie Hall when he's eight years old and he refuses to do his homework. And his mom takes him to the psychiatrist and he explains, you know, that the universe is expanding. He read that the universe is expanding. And in billions of years, it'll all blow up. So there's no point in doing my homework. And his mother upbraids him and says, we live in Brooklyn and Brooklyn's not expanding. <laughs> you know, so in other words, it's a it's an Alvy error. It's a type what philosophers call a, a category error. You're just thinking at the wrong level. Well, you know, uh, Bertrand Russell, the great mathematician from England, wrote one of the most depressing paragraphs in the history of the English language. He said that for all the tears and all the struggles that we humans have tried to attain something greater than ourselves, it's all for nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's just a law of physics that the sun will eat up the earth. And therefore, all the tears we shed are for nothing. Well, that was written in the 1930s, the most depressing paragraph ever written in the English language. But today we laugh. We don't, we don't get scared because we have rocket ships. We'll simply leave the earth. Well, now we realize that the universe is dying. The universe will one day be very cold, nothing but black holes and neutron stars and, and dead material everywhere. Life cannot exist near absolute zero, so it's all for nothing. But you see, I think by then, we'll probably be type four, extra galactic, beyond galactic, like the Q of Star Trek, type four. And at that point, when we approach the end of the universe, billions of years from now, I think we will leave the universe. We will leave the universe, enter another warmer universe, and mess up that universe as well. So we'll have two universes to mess up. You mean something like applying string theory to go through a rotating black hole, wormhole, or whatever, to get to one of these other universes that's more hospitable to human life, or whatever our life that's would right. be at that point. Yeah. But th but, but that, right. that misses so my, end, my point, uh, Michio, is that it, even if that never happens, what I do tonight with my child and my spouse and play with my dog and, and, and so on, it, it, I'm doing it because it matters now, not what happens 14 billion years from now or 50 billion years. I don't care what happens then. I won't be around. I, I care about tonight and tomorrow. Right. right. And that's what gives us meaning because we're attaining something. And like I said, as a race, we're beginning to become grandmasters of the game of chess. And individually, we're beginning to understand that the meaning of life is not given to us on a silver platter. That defeats the, the whole purpose. The whole purpose of the meaning of life is a struggle for it so that you get meaning from the struggle. That is the meaning of life, in my opinion. And so I think that we can take comfort knowing that when we go home tonight, play with our dog, first of all, we'll never be able to teach our dog the meaning of tomorrow, but the dog doesn't care. The dog loves us anyway, and we love the dog. You know, one of my favorite books was uh, Bob Wright's book, Non-Zero. And he kind of resurrects a little bit Teilhard de Chardin's idea of a new sphere. And, and behind all that is this idea that the, built into the laws of nature, there's a kind of a teleology toward intelligence and then toward something like a digitized life and that a universe like ours with our laws of nature will eventually give rise to something like higher beings, intelligence, and immortality through what you just described, and so on, and that there's a kind of directionality to it. Not, not God-driven, not, not, it's not religious, it's just, it's a kind of Aristotelian teleology marching toward something. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you mentioned the Copernican principle that we are not special, period. End of story, we're not special. We're insignificant. But there's also the Anthropic principle, 
And the anthropic principle is coming back because of string theory. And the anthropic principle has the opposite, exact opposite of the Copernican principle, but they're both compatible with every experiment that we've ever done. And the anthropic principle says we are special. We are very special because think of all the accidents that had to take place for us to become intelligent and conscious. An incredible number of accidents had to take place. First of all, if the nuclear force were stronger, a little bit stronger, the sun would have burnt out billions of years ago and we wouldn't be here. If the nuclear force were weaker, the sun would never have ignited to begin with and we would be cold and we still wouldn't be here. If gravity were a little bit stronger, the universe would have expanded and contracted and crushed us to death in, in a big crunch. If gravity were weaker, the universe would have expanded and we'd all die in a big freeze. So we have all these accidents strung together. And I first learned about this when I was in second grade. In second grade, I'll never forget. <laughs> my dying Dale remembered that my second grade teacher said, and I quote, God so loved the earth that he put the earth just right from the sun. <laughs> Not too close, because that's the oceans of oil. Not too far, because the oceans will freeze. And I was in second grade. And I said to myself, oh my God, that's right. We are just right from the sun. <laughs> well, now, of course, we've seen 4,000 exoplanets, which are too close, which are too far, with no life on them that we know of at all. And so there's two ways to resolve this anthropic problem. Either there is a God that created the universe just right for us to exist, or it's a crapshoot. It means nothing. We've won the lottery. That's all there is to it. So anyway, that is the exact opposite of the Copernican principle. Consciousness is so rare, so precious, that how could it have been an accident that it came out of nothing versus the Copernican principle, which is we are nothing. But in a way, you've just kind of made the argument for the fine-tunedness of the universe, uh, and yet you reject that in your book as being uh, an argument for God's existence. So then, then what is an argument for other than we're special? Yeah, well, these are two di diametrically opposed points of view, but you can meld them together with string theory, just like you can put together Buddhism and Presbyterian Judeo-Christian uh, philosophy. Um, string theory allows you to put together the Antarctic principle and the Copernican principle, okay? And, well, here's how you do it. First of all, people are amazed that the universe is so old. Why is the universe so old? The universe is really, really old, 13.8 billion years, and we've only been around 100,000, 200,000 years maximum for Homo sapiens. And why is the universe old? Well, the Copernican principle says, ha, it's because we're nothing. It's just random. We just happen to be in an old universe. Universes are old or not, doesn't matter. We're just nothing. But the anthropic principle says, no, there's a secret there. It took 13.8 billion years to evolve intelligence out of nothing. It took time. Why is the universe so old? It has nothing to do with the timeline, nothing to do with the dinosaurs. No, the universe is old because it took that long to create you and me. That's why the universe is so old. We're special. We're here today in an old universe precisely because we are conscious, and it took that long to create us. <laughs> Amazing. I so love that argument. The, yeah, that's great. What? String theory. It's, yeah, it's the, the, it's the new religion. It, it's, yeah. it's the, string theory will be the, the next religion, and you may be the guru of that religion. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, Mitch, yeah, string theory is what it is. It, it is that's right. It is what it is. Well, we've been going over an hour and a half. Uh, so let's wrap it up. Just give us uh, your thoughts on, on what you're working on next. How do you top the God equation, sort of figuring out the unified field theory? Well, the, the theory exists. String theory exists. Uh, there are thousands of physicists who are either trying to learn the theory or are publishing in the theory. But the theory is not in its final form, okay? So we want to compare it with experiments like dark matter and... Uh, and dark energy. 
it's not quite ready to be tested because it has many solutions, not just one, many solutions. We don't know which solution is correct. In other words, we don't got it down to one inch. Now, I'm the co-creator of string field theory. In the language of field theory, that is a language of Faraday, we can boil string theory down to an equation about two inches long. That's my equation, string field theory. But now we have membranes. And with membranes, that messes up my equation. And so we need a higher equation. And so maybe, maybe somebody watching this program will be inspired to write that one inch equation that contains both membranes and, and strings. And again, if they ever find that equation, tell me first and we'll publish <laughs> together. You're inviting so we'll a lot of profile. mail. You're, you're inviting a lot of mail, Michio. <laughs> for your fans. Yeah, already I'm getting a equations in the mail for your for your fans of your your, your popular books and, and documentaries and radio show and so on what are you working on uh in terms of popularization after this book are you doing any more documentary films or um just here and there tv companies call me and they they want me to do something but uh, a book tour as you know <laughs> requires a lot of work every day there's some place to go somebody to meet uh, some article to write, some lecture to give. Uh, being on a book tour is like uh, full-time business, as you know. Well, congratulations on the, the God Equation. It comes out today. I'm, we'll release this the day the book comes out next week, week after, I guess. And, uh, mm -hmm. and again, thanks for your work. Thanks for your writings. I, I love your books. And uh, you're always really fun to talk to. Big thinking, big ideas. Gotta love it. Thanks, Michio. Okay, well, thank you. Real pleasure to be on your show.